factors uh, earlier um, than, than you all. And so please forgive me if I'm slow to start. Um, also, it's my understanding that this is, a, I hope I have it right, that this is a somewhat relaxed and informal um, setting for, for the conversation. So I, I have tried, um... oh yeah, the song. <laughs> Yeah, let's do that. Um, we can do that at the transition. I just saw that in the chat. I'm hoping it's okay that I have um, not the most formal of talks uh, prepared. I could give a more formal one if you'd rather, but I just wanna make sure it's okay that I'm taking a more informal uh, tour through some things that I'm trying to work out and hoping you guys might um, have some insight that you can share with me about these questions I'm working on. Um, does that seem reasonable for the expectation today? Yeah, that's completely fine. We're excited. Great. Um, I apologize in advance too that this may not be the best organized um, because I have a lot of things on my mind, um, but hopefully it'll go smoothly. Um, so I I have these um, these comics from the Boondocks and the Peanuts um, up here uh, on my my title slide because um, I, I sort of unearthed them. I found them again recently, but these you know I grew up reading Peanuts as a kid, so we've got Sally and Charlie Brown there at the bottom. And um, and then as, as a college student, I read a lot of Boondocks. Never actually watched the show, um, but I was very interested in Aaron Magruder's take because I knew in part. Uh, I mean, obviously, I, I recognized some uh, some synergies in my own uh, cultural community um, there. But also, I was interested in in his the influence that Peanuts had on him as a kid. And um, and these two uh, these two comics always kind of um, grab my attention. Um, in the top one, I won't read it all through. Hopefully, you can see it uh, well enough. Um, I don't have uh, <laughs> permissions for these, so I, I blotted them out a little bit. <laughs> I uh, in the top one, you know, you have these. Two oh, sorry, should I pause? I know. Can I folks know. please mute? Just Okay, um, so uh, so in the top one we have um, you know uh, Huey and Riley who are brothers and Huey's the older one and he's you know kind of the uh, the radical intellectual and um, Riley brings more of the uh, you know the lived experience um, and the street experience to their debates. And I see them as sense making and um, introducing some challenging philosophical questions here. Um, and essentially, Huey wants to guide Riley down what he thinks is the right and righteous path. And, and Riley's pushing back. Um, and he's pushing back in a lot of interesting ways. Um, but I'll just read the beginning and the end. So Huey says to Riley, uh, Riley, from now on, I'm taking personal responsibility for your actions. Here is a list of unacceptable behavior. Commit it to memory. Um, I have children, and I, I see this happen with my oldest and youngest at a certain degree on a regular basis. Uh, and Riley basically is like, what, Negro, please? This is not happening. Um, and then they go through this whole dialogue about different forms of, um, of power and authority and resistance. And um, in the end, you know, Riley lands some effective some effective points in the debate. And uh, and Huey's a little bit stumped. And he finally says, well, I quit. Can you at least try to stay out of jail? Riley says, I'm not making any promises. So there's this sort of set of things happening for me in this, in this one little comic strip, right? There's this kinship thing going on, um, this desire to care for one another. There's this intellectual inquiry into power and resistance, um, what qualifies as justice, what qualifies as violence, what qualifies as, as, uh, as acceptable societally. And, you know, they end at a, at a kind of impasse that expresses a, a kind of a mutual respect, I think, but also a kind of, uh, you know, fear for what might happen. Um, and ultimately, I think both characters are trying to move toward um, a set of relationships uh, that allow them to negotiate power. Um, in the Peanuts strip, 
uh, we have, I think her name's Sally. She's talking to her brother, Charlie. She says, we've been reading poems in school, but I never understand any of them. And how am I supposed to know which poems to like? And Charlie Brown, without even skipping a beat, just somebody tells you, you know, someone else tells you how to make sense um, of, of what matters in the world. And there's a, a relationship to me uh, in these questions of uh, where is this someone? Where does authority exist? How does it relate to justice? How does it relate to learning? And, you know, what is the nature of young people uh, coming to understand the nature of those political relations um, in their lives? Um, so it's sort of a playful entry into that question, um, but it it's a way to kind of remind me of some of the, the practical questions that I think we face uh, when we're thinking about learning and particularly learning across contexts and what I'm describing as relational scale. I'll get more into that in a moment. Um, but uh, one of the things that I was hoping to do today, I don't know if it'll work out, is to talk about an idea um, that I am working on. I'm working on a book and I'm trying to sort out its organization and its audience. And um, it's gotten a bit unruly. Um, and it it comes out of a, a couple of concerns and questions um, that I have and a couple of things that are emerging for me in this current um, moment around the world and, and, and here in the US and, and in the West in general. Um, and so two things are, are, are coming out uh, for me. And um, I think I'll start with maybe the easier one. A couple of years, it's not easy, but a couple of years ago, I started to pose the question to a lot of people, um, you know, what are the social sciences and humanities responses to violence in all of their forms? And um, I pose this question to campus police officers. Um, I posed it to my colleagues in the Department of Communication here who are an interdisciplinary group working in a lot of different areas uh, that are relevant. I've posed it um, to my colleagues. I'm a co-director of the Black Studies Project here at UCSC, I've posed it there. And one of the things I was noting, um, particularly around mass violence in institutional spaces like schools and college campuses, um, was that most of the response struck me as um, a combination of kind of militaristic, because it's about um, responding to a weaponized threat um, and staying out of the way of law enforcement and not a lot of thought about con communication and not a lot of thought about um, what the broader circumstances are. Um, that lead us into these moments that feel um, really untenable and out of our control. Um, the, the question is, is so incredibly urgent to me, not just in the state of um, physical and gun violence, but in a broader sense about what's the, what's the notion of violence in our society. And so I've looked a lot to uh, you know peace studies and other kinds of approaches to building infrastructures um, that are uh, that are driven by different uh, orientations. And in, recently I came to the point of view because I have a series of elder neighbors and family members um, who are not receiving adequate care. It occurred to me that uh, the, the societal response that might come more clearly into relief through social sciences and humanities might have to do with the notion of care. Um, now, obviously we've been living through a time where um, people are talking a lot about care, mutual care, et cetera. I'm talking about, I think, a, a systemic level uh, and a relational level of care uh, where when we go through these sort of basic ideas of how life, we can predict how life is functioning for people and, and how we have our struggles and our tensions, um, that there are these ideas of, you know, what do people need to feel like when they're struggling, when they're suffering, care is available to them? And what are the systemic ways that that is denied? Um, and what are the ways that we witness and experience those forms of denial of care um, across the board? And so some of those are things like literally my very elderly neighbor who's living with a broken hip they will not do surgery on that hip for various reasons, can't really leave her house anymore, and is 100% reliant on neighbors to 
check on her and look after her. Um, and no matter how hard we are trying to make sure that the various services that are supposed to be available to her are available to her, um, it's just not, it's not really happening. Um, I think there's a, a very intense feeling of helplessness and a problematic um, communication that says in all kinds of ways, and that's just one, one example, one small example, um, when people are struggling and suffering, their needs will go in some way unmet. Uh, we can look to natural disasters for this. Um, Hurricane Katrina comes to mind as a good example. And we can look to our everyday disasters and crises that people face um, when uh, we don't develop, I think, a muscle or a capacity for that kind of care. And I'm interested in how that relates to questions of, uh, of power and politics and ethics. Um, and so that's, that's sort of one area that is like just as a big picture, um, an area that I've been trying to think through. Um, then if I shift over uh, to the project, the book that I'm trying to write, um, part of the challenge that I have is I want to, I think I want to write five books, but I really need to just write one right now. <laughs> and um, I have a couple of different entries into that text um, that I want to raise as a sort of orienta orientation to the conversation that we'll have today. Um, the first is this uh, question of theorizing development and becoming. Um, uh, a lot of uh, the work that I do both engages and embraces notions of development and is highly critical of notions of development, depending on how we think across scales. Um, so if we're talking about um, development that leads us at the sort of macro scale, NGOs looking at development as a sort of movement toward uh, sort of a depoliticization of uh, the shifts in resources and power in a community, um, then I can enter into a very critical view. I think in the sense of human development and learning, um, the ways historically in our field we've talked about development, they tend to also be somewhat depoliticized but they sit side by side with intractable problems like the persistence of deficit orientations, um, uh, problems of precarity and poverty, uh, problems of uh, racism, ableism, sexism, et cetera. And so I've been trying to think through frameworks and uh, theoretical orientations to development that I think look more like uh, the, the, uh, the conversation that's in our field about becoming. and. Um, in particular, I'm concerned with um, communal multi-generational orientations to development and the forms of development that exist when we are in groups like classrooms. Um, and I have a recent uh, I ISLS publication with Victor Minces on a notion called harmonized mutual development, where we're talking about notions of becoming collectively in classrooms and that kind of thing. So I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, in a few minutes, but um, in terms of development, one of the ideas that I've tried to work with is what I experienced in my own family with my grandmother and other adults around me, um, which was a notion you may have heard before in your own families, um, take what you have and make what you want out of it. And I've been writing about this idea of being a child in an environment where that was the framework for development that was, and for becoming that was around me. And the way I've been writing about it is to think through what it yielded as an, uh, as a, just a complete, the, a complete departure from a deficit orientation, which was you have an idea, you have the capacity to make it happen. And there are resources around you and we completely trust you to work it out. And at the same time that that notion of take what you have and make what you want out of it was presented to me by my grandmother, and others, um, the grandmothers in general and the grandfathers in general, I think um, there was also the presence. I wasn't ever alone. I was independent, but I was always surrounded by people who cared and by people who believed in me. And as such, as I moved through that process of any given moment following that advice, as soon as I had any kind of success with it, it was celebrated, it was noticed, and it was uh, encouraged. And so to me, it was a, an experience of, you know, a kind of wisdom that was planted in me that I, that I was receiving 
um, you know, through ancestors, right? Straight to me that I can keep passing on. And it organized a certain kind of practice and relationship in my family and for me. And so I'm thinking about how to bring together these kinds of um, daily life theorizing and wisdom together with um, what we're doing in our field. Um, right, Dr. Like, Dr. Sorry yeah. to interrupt real quick. Um, should we see the slides moving? Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm having a long introductory slide, but I will move okay. on. Okay, wonderful, wonderful. I just wanted to check. No problem. Um, the other thing that I'm thinking about is this notion of democratic practice and collective continuance in daily life. Um, in essence, I'm asking how does democratic practice come to belong to us? And in a lot of the work that I do uh, in uh, my project called Democracy Lab and various other projects that I'm engaged with, um, a lot of what we see is that there's not a lot of opportunity for what we would describe as democratic practice uh, or models of collective continuance that we're seeing. So in the family, in the church, in the workplace, uh, there are often these more authoritarian structures in the school. Um, and so we are thinking a lot about how to produce environments, how to design infrastructures that actually make it possible to negotiate power and decision-making in meaningful ways um, across communities. Um, but to your point, I'll move on to my next slide. Let's see. Um, so given that sort of background of things sort of bubbling up for me, questions that I'm having, um, these are the two questions that I put forward um, for this conversation. How do young people in particular and multi-generational groups more broadly produce infrastructures that support increasing participation and processes for renegotiating power relations? And the reason I'm thinking about infrastructures is that I'm very concerned with practice um, and participation rights. And um, I think one of the things that I increasingly see in my teaching um, and in my approach to asking questions about democratic practice in daily life is what are the practices that are actually available to people that are sustainable, that allow people to participate versus what are the discussions people have and the debates that they have, but the things that hold them outside of practice. Um, I begin with an orientation toward communities of practice from Laven Winger's um, Situated Learning. And I've continued to try to understand uh, what the nature of communities of practice is and how they can help us attend to where practice itself is actually available. Um, the second question, how and when is the character of participation in a given community of practice rendered visible then, is a question that also has to do with uh, the structures of communities and the infrastructures that support communities to exist. In essence, I'm asking us to treat community as an analytical resource more so than uh, a descriptive resource. And um, in that sense, um, I'm going to talk a little bit through some of the things I'm seeing across the, the projects that I've been doing. So I have a recent uh, paper coming out soon called Designing for Productive Politics and Participation in Research Practice Partnerships. Um, I'm happy to talk more about that um, if you like. Um, but one of the key ideas here that I was trying to work through was, um, in general, in my experience in our field, um, the notion of communities of practice and legitimate peripheral participation is pretty celebratory, and I tend to be on that bandwagon as well. Um, at the same time, um, there is the potential for legitimate peripheral participation to be le the legitimizing of sustained marginalization. And so Levin Wenger do describe this directly in their text, but I don't see it um, as, as often taken up, I think in part because um, the response that that text had to sort of individual notions of cognition and learning was to push back on that. And so this was an answer or a response. It was, it, you know, there was a politics and an ethics to responding with the notion that learning is something that is social um, and cultural and historical. And um, this notion of fixed marginal positions seemed to me to be the thing that I saw a lot in my work with young people and communities. Um, 
And so on one hand, um, there's this notion of fixed marginal positions where movement is limited, con controlled, or mysterious. And what I found uh, across the studies that I've done is that young people in particular tend to perceive power as centered um, and trying to kind of move from a token or peripheral point of view or place to push through to that center of power. Um, Levin Wenger specifically argue, you know, that participation, legitimate peripheral participation as a trajectory toward full participation was the model and not toward the center. And so I've been sort of grappling with the notion of um, full participation versus centered participation and how do we come to theorize and understand those ideas. And my, my sense is that uh, from the analyses that we've been up to, students and young people tend to be perceiving a fixed center when their peripheral position is also remarkably fixed. Um, the notion that full participation may be the narrative that people are sharing, the ideal that people are speaking to versus the reality of people's experience is, um, is the point in question. So when I was writing this piece, the editors asked if I would produce some kind of visual. This is one among many ways to try to visualize um, what I'm trying to get at with thinking through what the movement and the embodiment toward full participation might look like. And so on the, on the right is this sort of, you know, a lot of dotted lines and, and sort of the, the, the notion of a porous, um, legitimate peripheral participation or full participation is actually intended and supported over time. And that there are many trajectories um, toward full participation and not such, so much such a singular path. Um, the limits of my graphic design skills are making this look more linear than I think it actually is. Um, but uh, sort of hopefully um, the idea uh, is, is here, is present. Um, Let's see. So the reason that I want to think through this is because I think that one of the first responsibilities of young people who are entering into participation in multi-generational communities and trying to influence uh, relationships across scales of power um, is to discern whether or not and in what ways they're in the fixed marginal position versus the supported uh, participation, full participation model? Um, and what are the practices that allow people to, to recognize that? And this notion of a productive politics is also a notion of uh, the, the positive side of disruption. Um, so what is it that allows people to discern the degree to which they have free movement within a community? And a lot of that happens, I think, uh, when people actually engage in practices that can disrupt what's happening. Gosh, what's happening? Um, so this brings me to um, this question of relational scale that I've been talking about. Uh, um, a lot of the, the work that we do in the learning sciences is, is funded by the National Science Foundation, is organized around um, sort of, especially those of us who do community work, small sort of local scale practices, trying to understand how those practices then might scale to other conditions. And so, um, you know, with implementation grants and, you know, working toward publishing curricula and that sort of thing, the notion of scale and scaling up, I think, has a tendency to be about um, taking an, an idea, a design, uh, and then scaling it to many places. Um, and I wanted to think about um, the ways in which, because my work tends to sit at a sort of a sort of hybrid, sort of third space, meso level set of interactions where people are are between environments, whether it's students in um, in uh, an advisory board who are doing their work in the school library as opposed to sort of observing them at their school campuses and in their classrooms, but are trying to influence policy going on over at the school board meeting and what's going on in the superintendent's office and even at the state level, right? There are these levels of relationship that keep appearing when young people and communities try to negotiate power. And so I wanted to think carefully about how you scale relationship 
because what I think is that it's very, very difficult. So there's a relationship between two people, student teacher, peer to peer, child parent, et cetera. And then there are the sort of local community practices uh, and relationships. So for instance, in my current work, we have a, a nearly 20 year partnership with a learning center in a subsidized apartment complex. And that local community has its own set of uh, practices and engagements and uh, the way that we build relationship with them uh, both for the research team that has the long-term uh, deep relationships versus the undergraduates who come in maybe for only 10 weeks at a time. Um, those kinds of relational practices and community require a different kind of work um, in terms of scaling uh, beyond those interpersonal moments. Um, and then there's thinking across organizational roles and positions. Um, and so in uh, sticking with this example with the Learning Center, our practicum course um, brings undergraduates to work as buddies with um, children and youth who live in the apartment complex. But the apartment complex itself is inside of a set of relationships because of the way that it's um, the way that it is owned and funded and managed. And so um, in order to have a learning center in these apartments, usually that's a requirement from the housing and urban development um, department. And so we're talking at the sort of macro institutional policy level. And then you have these uh, investors, sometimes nonprofit investors, and sometimes just real estate investors who come in to own and, and, and um, build uh, equity and, and their own capital through the ownership of these apartments and this real estate. Um, and they get incentives um, to have these kinds of learning centers uh, when they get this federal funding. Um, but then they have to partner with nonprofit organizations to run the learning centers and provide the case management. That's all part of the policy, right? So what you end up with is you have case managers, learning center directors, property managers, right? So these are these different organizational roles that exist inside of or in relation to the interpersonal work. And you've got the researchers and students um, who are coming from the university, bringing another institutional orientation. Um, and so you have all of us sort of playing these roles. So when I'm at the Learning Center, I'm Dr. A, which is what the center director dubbed me the first day I walked in and it stuck and that's what I've been ever since um, and who I've been. But I, at various times, I'm the professor uh, for the course or I'm the research uh, PI or I'm Dr. A to the kids or I'm just another woman of color in a community filled with people of color, right? And so all of these sets of relations and positions shift how we, um, how we respond to each other and also what we expect of each other, what our responsibilities are toward one another. Um, then there's this notion of, you know, working through actual institutional tensions. Um, and this is, you know, when the apartment building, building changed hands, um, when uh, housing and urban development introduced funding to remodel and the kind of disruptions those institutional opportunities produced. There's also the tension with the university itself and community partnership. For those of you who do community partnered work, you've probably encountered the challenge where when the university is involved, more kinds of funding, larger amounts of funding are often made more available with the community partner. But in my experience, those funds tend to build the university. And, uh, and I've observed and I've, and I've listened to my partners around the hesitation they have, hesitation is a nice word, uh, in partnering with people from the university because of that. Because often it takes a small organization that's working locally and working effectively, and then through this influx of resources can kind of raise it up uh, to a space of operation that it then cannot sustain because those funds exist through the university relationships, such that if the PI moves on, and the re that relationship goes away, the funding goes away, and it leaves the communities in, in, in worse shape um, than they were to begin with. And what I mean by building the, the university is, you know, for those of us who write grants, you know, it's, it's things we need to do, you know, um, funding graduate student researchers and funding postdocs and, you know, funding the infrastructure of the university, but funding the infrastructure of the community and the community partner is a harder thing to accomplish. And um, so I've been looking for institutional partners who are um, who have a, a, the kind of gravitational pull that a university has, 
um, but with a different uh, commitment in community. And so far, the public library systems are the ones that seem to have um, that balance from, from what I can tell. The reason I'm going into all this detail about these sort of scaling, this scaling of relations is because I'm trying to think about, as I said at the beginning, these questions of development and these questions of care across societal position as sort of um, concerns with uh, power relations and ethical practice. So what is it that we have to understand to produce um, just, ethical, equitable, and um, open relations, right, for movement of, of people as opposed to enclosure or restriction of people um, in their practice. And so this is where I get to this notion of nodal design. Um, how am I doing? I'm almost gonna be done here, just a couple minutes. Um, so I have this project, I'm gonna skip to it really quickly so you can get a picture of it, different project, not that one, not that one, not that one, this one. Um, so uh, there is a cognitive scientist that I partner with who uh, works on a project called um, Listening to Waves. And one day he was trying to explain to me his opening activity. And if you look here, you'll see that these kids all have, um, they have pipes in their hands. Um, and what he was doing to start off the activity was he would do this. He'd come up and see if I can do it right. So he would not say anything. His pedagogy is just to walk up. He holds us and he goes just like that. And uh, off he goes. Um, and then he hands the pipe to the students. And then the students take the pipe and they start, you know, and they do this and then everyone laughs and they try to figure out, well, how did he do that? And eventually um, they start to recognize, because he'll demonstrate again, that he's holding the pipe in a very particular place. He's holding it at the node, which, as he was describing to me, basically allows the sound, it's the position that allows the wave to move with the least restriction. And I thought it was such um, a beautiful metaphor for justice. It has form, it has shape, right? It distinguishes a kind of practice. Um, but if you hold something in the wrong place, well, maybe the, the place that resists its movement, you don't get free flow. You still get sound, you still have a practice, but you don't have the freest flow of movement. But if you find the nodes, then you can actually hold the space for particular forms of practice. So in essence, this is a kind of infrastructure for practice. And if you hold it in the, in the nodal space, then you have allow for the freest, fullest movement and sustained movement of the wave, which produces the sound. And so this idea of nodal design is for me, a way to think about how can we support discerning the degree to which our free movement um, and our just orientations are present in a particular kind of infrastructure or design? Um, I skipped through a couple of contexts here because in the paper that I published recently, I write about a couple of these different research practice partnerships. And I just wanted to give a feel for the different kinds of spaces and contexts that we're working in. So this, these are pictures uh, of the learning center over time and the practicum course that I mentioned. Um, so you can get a feel for what's happening there. We recently started a partnership with the Maritime Museum uh, through uh, a wonderful scholar, Caroline Collins, a recent grad from our department, um, who is working on a project called Black Pacific and working on bringing uh, exhibits that tell the stories of Black mariners and the Black Pacific in ways that extend well beyond the Middle Passage, which is mostly what we have in, in um, sort of Black historical understanding in relationship to water, vessels, land, et cetera. And, um, and our students from this environment now are getting to participate in this new context. They, most of them have never been to the museum. They went there for the first time. It's on the, it's on the water in San Diego on the, on the bay. Um, and they're going on ship's vessels and all of this kind of thing. Um, but there is a lot of fraught uh, cultural historical work going on. And who comes to that space and who participates in that space is highly contested. And so this is an opportunity for us to think through some of these designs. 
and who they're for and who they invite and, um, and how they produce learning and participatory environments. Um, this is an image from a, a research practice partnership in the Sacramento area, except for the bottom right picture, that's for my dissertation work, students trying to change policy. But the rest of these images are um, sort of representations of the different contexts that are functioning across this goal to produce these practices. But the challenge in this project was as a six week summer project, students were getting to see a lot of practice, but this was a pretty good example of the case where students weren't actually getting into a sustained relationship with practice so that they could sort of visit where decisions happen and produce um, artifacts that they could share, but they didn't have a sustained entry into these sort of infrastructures of practice that allow them to negotiate power over time. And so that's a challenge that that project was working through. Um, finally, I'll, I'll try to wrap up here in the next one minute or two. Um, this is an image from um, a project I continue to work on in collaboration with Wayne Yang over uh, in the Department of Ethnic Studies. And he's also the provost of Muir College here on our campus. And uh, we work on a project called Black Like Water. It's not a research project, um, but part of that project is a week that we do right before orientation called Black Surf Week. And Black Surf Week is basically an opportunity for students who are coming to campus and faculty and staff and their kids and family and et cetera to basically get surf lessons for free. They come to campus. Uh, we talk a lot about relate Black and Indigenous relationships with land and water. We talk about the politics of access and free flow of engagement in the history and present of San Diego. And, um, and people come out together for just like three days um, and get surf instruction with our campus rec department that also offers classes. Um, and it's been remarkable how these three days produce a something that tends to very rapidly dissolve the hierarchies that exist in our university otherwise, so that students, faculty, staff, grads, undergrads, families, you know, are all participating in a space together um, in, in a very, in almost the development of a kind of um, communal kinship. Um, and it's when you run into each other on campus, it's like a family reunion, even though you only saw these people for a couple of days. Um, and it's, we're learning so much about how students don't actually feel like these spaces and know these spaces are inaccessible in some way, but are developing practices to gain access. At the same time, we know that sustaining that access is quite difficult because in, even surfing, where you need an ocean and a surfboard and et cetera, requires all kinds of infrastructure and support to make it something you do together. And so it's an opportunity to think about these relationships between these histories, the politics, the communities. And one of the most remarkable things is how REC seems to be the most public facing entity on our campus for a public campus. It's sort of remarkable that this is the place where people can actually gain entry and relationship to the university and to the campus. Um, so with that, um, I think I will just end on this last slide, which I'm happy to discuss, but it's one of the ways I've been trying to theorize about development practice and the development of infrastructures um, to support this kind of nodal design idea. And that's what the book is. The book is supposed to kind of pull all of these things together, but figuring out how to, um, how to, organize it is a, is a big challenge for me. Um, I hope that was not too all over the place and that it was somewhat useful. I, I'm gonna stop now and I appreciate um, the opportunity to, uh, to share. Um, it looks like my PowerPoint just quit, which is great. <laughs> <laughs> I was looking for like how to end the show and it just, it just died, so. <laughs> um, so that's it, thank you uh, for, for you know, devoting um, some of your minutes to this. I really appreciate it. You can hear us, right? We're unmuted on here. Um, I can hear you. Yeah. Okay, awesome, wonderful. So thank you so much. This has been 
uh, really uh, instructive and illuminating, got me thinking about a lot of things. I have some questions, but I'm going to actually uh, open the floor to others and um, see if anyone, if you're, you can either put your question in the chat or raise your hand if you're online, we can see you, or if you're here, just raise your, your hand here and I'll call on you and, and manage the chat q and a any have questions mary go ahead sure i i'm i'd love to to talk about this it was just fantastic dr booker thank you um such interesting things i don't even know where to begin um one of the things at the end when you talked about on stage it made me think of a term that one of my colleagues uses all the time uh, christelle palpacor lee teaches in the department of learning and teaching and does a lot of community engaged work as well and she always uses the word to animate the work to animate it and i just feel like it sort of relates to what you were saying it's like the being of the work versus the you know demonstrating or you know, somehow being separate from the work. So anyway, that's beautiful. I wanted to ask one question though, about um, that beautiful so metal. <laughs> Are you not able to hear me or did you want to? I just wanted to let you know, I'm taking notes in case you hear me. Ah, like, okay. Good. And you know, it's interesting because Christelle's been using that word a lot lately and she's a French speaker. And I want to ask her about where this word is coming from. If it's something she's transferring in or if it's a term that's being used for talking about this kind of you know community engaged work but um and then I also thought your metaphor with the sound waves was just gorgeous too and really compelling and you know thought provoking and I wanted to ask you to follow up on it just to see what kind of examples can you give of the kinds of, I think you might've said infrastructure or supports or tools that allow them for that fullest movement and free expression or free participation. If you could just talk about like some of the, the efforts that are made to, to either cover or uncover nodes. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, that's a great question. I think that's something I'm thinking about a lot. I think I interrupted you to say I was typing when you said the term that you wanted uh, to Oh, I was talking about the metaphor about the waves and the nodes. Okay, that was the term that you were talking about? Oh, no, 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 no. The term, oh, Ravi put it in the chat, it was animate. Yeah. So okay. to animate the work. And so she'll often say, you know, we need to animate it. And, and I found it really beautiful how she uses that word. Um, because it really is, you know, it's per performing it, doing it, you know, being one body, like you're not separated from it, is the way I've understood it. So mm. oh, yeah, thank you for the for the comment and the question, Mary. Mm -hmm. uh, I do like the word animate. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I I'm gonna I'll come back to that maybe, but um, I I think, you know, one of the things I've been looking for are these examples, right, with these metaphors. And so when I, one of the examples I tried to give was this notion of like what I experienced and what people in my my family and heritage community experience around take what you have and make what you want out of it. It's a kind of, um, to me, it's a kind of nodal support, right? You can take action. You should take action. You should make use of what's around you. And certainly you will be able to make what what you're trying to make, right? To make what you have happen, happen. So that's like a sort of theoretical uh, construct that I think supports um, practice. Um, I think in terms of um, looking for the kinds of fluidity and openness that I'm talking about, um, I'm in search of good examples. Uh, I find a lot of restrictive examples and not as many of that sort of free flowing fluid example, but I think one of the really nice examples um, comes from uh, you know, the arts and music, a lot of, a lot of um, uh, approaches. I, one example I would give comes from, why am I losing his name all of a sudden? One of Elliot Eisner's students that I went to school with. I don't know why, his name will come to me in a minute and I'll send it, I'll send it to you after the fact. Um, but he, in his work, one of the things that he studied was, um, he went to an arts high school and he studied 
uh, kids who are um, in the music program in the art school and the sort of classical music symphony instruction they were receiving. And then there were groups of them who had formed garage bands. And so he was watching the same kids in these different environments and the practices that they engaged. In the symphony, uh, in the sort of classical instruction, the, the sort of rules about um, what to play, how to play, are, are they already exist, right? Uh, the sort of a historicized set of rules and the sort of the, the, the instructor or conductor is guiding you to sort of tell you what you need to do. And in, do, in so doing, you participate in this classical tradition and you, know, you have this beautiful musical tradition happening across an entire orchestra. Um, but it's fit into a very specific structure. So it has certain kinds of limits. When the same kids are playing in their garage band, the kinds of practices they are engaged in, same instruments, same kids, right? But now they're writing their own music. Um, they're, they're being critical with each other in a productive way to produce the outcomes that they want. I, could, I suppose you could say they're animated, right? Um, that they are the ones who have the say, right? Now, can you say one thing can happen without the other? Sure. There are plenty of kids who are in garage bands who are never in any kind of symphony orchestra. Does the one support the other? Probably. But the practices that they engaged are distinct. They weren't just sort of mimicking what their, uh, what their instructor was doing. Um, and so they had stakes. But they also have, they have instruments. They have song structure. They have goals for like, you know, eventually playing in public outside of their garage, right? Maybe recording an LP. So the, sort of the infrastructure of practices um, what you can do with your instruments, um, how you can record, where you can play, what you have to produce to get into the world of playing publicly, right? So those kinds of uh, examples to me feel sort of similar, and I'm sure there are better ones, and I even have thought through them and have them, but I don't have them at the ready. When I come up with them, though, I'll, I will bring them up. No, that's perfect. Nope. Thank you. It sounds like they're creating nodes in the example you gave, which I think is really cool, too. Oh, creating nodes. That's interesting. Mm -hmm thought that far. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, I think there are lots of good examples of this. Um, I think for me, a lot of it is the degree to which the participants can discern where they can go. And infrastructure has to do with sustainable supported practice. So for instance, with the kids in Davis and Sacramento, um, a lot of what was happening in that structure was that the adults had those practices and those relationships, and they were making their networks available to students temporarily. But the students didn't have any continued entry into that once those were closed, right? Um, but the students have their own networks. And we also weren't at that point in the study figuring out how to mobilize their networks and practices. So I think infrastructure is a term that helps us think both through um, the sort of mediating artifacts across scales of relationship, right? What makes this available to everyone? Um, and or to broader groups of people with trajectories of practice, as well as um, what are the sort of connections that we can make with our own existing, you know, we have to make connections that allow us to sustain this. I think health is another area where this is a big deal. Clinically, we, we, we talk a lot about individual health. That's something we've worked on in our project at the, at the apartment complex. Um, you know, you go to the doctor, you get a diagnosis, it's for you, but then you go live your life in community. So if you're supposed to change how you eat, how do you do that when you're also raising your family, right? So what are the social conditions and the communal conditions that let us think about our health collectively? Um, and those are those are different, right? And and I think there are some restrictions and constraints there that that could be more nodal. So um, I hope that makes sense. I'm talking too much. Uh, I see Nicole has a question, but wants to wait for students. Do you have any questions from? Nicole, I think you can go ahead. <laughs> okay, I could talk to Angela about this all day. Hi, Angela. Um, I'm curious about the, like, what utility you find in the concepts of democracy and of, like, words like the civic. Right now, I know we've talked about this a little before, but mm -hmm. is there any value in terms of infrastructure that systems of democratic governance still have for us. I guess I'm thinking a lot about the election. Obviously, I'm thinking a lot about um, yeah. you know, the, the unraveling of our current democratic structures that have never actually functioned. And I just wonder like, what, you, what value you gain, if any, from using that term or thinking about the civic in relation to these nodes and in relation to building infrastructure for relations of freedom. 
uh, thank you uh, for the question. I should have taken notes on that one. So maybe you guys will share the recording with me. Um, <laughs> uh, bye, bye, Friday. <laughs> um, I, uh, um, okay, a couple of thoughts. Um, I tend to use the term democratic practice more so than I use the term democracy, although my project is called Democracy Lab and I do see some um, ideational utility to the term. I. I think there's a lot to critique and I think critique is very helpful. Um, in a personal sense, um, my very best friend is Romanian and immigrated here as, as an 18 year old. And we talk a lot about the degree to which, at least in this country, people are, are conscious of the ways that our democracy doesn't actually function much differently than um, you know, the communist government of Eastern Europe in the 1980s before she moved. Um, and I think for me, the utility is in thinking through where we have responsibility for one another. It goes back to what I was saying at the earlier moments about our, our obligations uh, in terms of care, which are hard. They're hard to meet. Caring for fellow uh, beings, caring for um, human, non-human relations, um, being humble about that and learning from other ways of being in the world, I think is difficult. I think democratic practice and civic life have something to contribute in terms of a framework for at least idealized relationships. Um, one of the ways that I've been trying to discuss this is I've, just, I've been using soccer as a metaphor or football um, for the rest of the world. Um, I, I say, okay, um, I want to think about democratic practice as our relations in everyday life and where we have and what we're learning, even though we're not directly learning. So kids in schools learn over at least a 12 year period, 13 year period, that they have very little influence over institutions in their lives. Um, we don't have to do anything but put them in school for them to learn that they do not have the influence over what's happening there. So we're teaching that. Um, and then and then people emerge from that experience with that as being one of their core understandings of, of, of what a what a democratic institution or a democratized institution or space can be. Um, I think one of the problems is then we think about and we teach about the structures of governance. And that's not actually what I want to think about. I want to think about the structures of relationship. And so um, I think it's very difficult for us to actually understand what do all these people we just elected do? What is their practice? What makes them good at their practice? What is corrupt about the practice in the relationship? It's hard to know because we don't actually have a relationship to that practice at all. And so um, in soccer, I'm gonna use World Cup metaphors here. People play football, I'm gonna call it football, all over the world. They make space with a ball in a field, they produce infrastructures, they produce teams, they produce networks of relationship, they, they, you know, they do all kinds of things to make it happen. And so when they play the game, um, the, the game belongs to them as a practice, right? When we play that, I don't play soccer. So, you know, for someone who knows more, feel free to, or football, feel free to correct me. But the idea that we know something about it, that we have a stake in it, that we build infrastructures for ourselves to participate in it means in some way it's ours, it belongs to us. We can appreciate then when someone is exceptional, right? We can watch a player and go, you know, wow, that that person is, I understand how it is that they're doing something amazing because I recognize what it takes, right? They also can recognize when at the big FIFA level, World Cup corruption and, and, and et cetera, they can understand and critique these sort of extractive relationships in the sport that produce all of this wealth and negotiate politics around the world and all of these things, right? So there's a relationship that allows people to, de to then fundamentally critique how those structures work without losing that they have football themselves, that it belongs to them. I don't think we have the same kind of relationship with democratic practice, and I think we need it. Where are the places where we do that work together? And what does it actually mean to us to have these collective negotiated relationships across difference where we still have this nodal space, right? Where we have as much freedom and flexibility and care with one another and we honor our obligations to one another um, while, which I think is a, both a, it's, it's in part a civic condition, right? But it requires the support to actually participate in why it's hard and to build skill in it and then to recognize who is good at it and why. And so then I think it would change the nature of our 
broader institutional structures. So that's a super long answer, Nicole. I hope I hope that that so was, for them. Yeah, it was really helpful. Thank you. Thanks for the question. Um, anybody have any last question? We're a little bit over time, but I want to make sure that people take advantage of Dr. Booker being here and asking and ask questions if you have any. No? This has been really fantastic. It's, uh, it's gotten me thinking a lot about, I think the idea of uh, scaling as uh, around relationship building is something that uh, really spoke to me. We're, we're working with uh, a district and uh, the students in the project are trying to come up with these proposals uh, for change, which are at the level of sort of policy and, and structures. Um, and figuring out how to negotiate that space and build relationship with people that have power and privilege in that space. And what does that look like? And how do you scale that when some of the people that you work with end up leaving? Uh, I think that's right, that the tenuous relationship is something difficult to think about. This has been helpful helped me a lot to think about these things. I'm sure everyone here has found things from your talk to, to relate to, to take back with them, to help them think further. Truly appreciate it. Um, one last big thank you. Well, uh, thank you so much for, for having me. And uh, you know, if you have pushback or questions or ideas, I would love to discuss them. I'm really bad about email, but like if you throw Rutgers in the title, I'll try really hard to respond. I mean, feel free to write to me. Uh, Nicole has my mobile number, so you know I could always ask her to text me, and I will. I'm happy to respond. Um, it's very nice to to at least get to see some of you and uh, be in the room together. I really appreciate it. Yeah, it's been great. Thank you. Oh, the book. Can you show the book both? Like I know that. Um, yeah, it's still yeah. So this is an absolutely amazing book called Power and Privilege in the Learning Sciences. I highly recommend it. I really do. It's it's the lovely part about it is that the chapters are organized in a particular way, the way they're written, that you can really relate between chapters in a way that's very hard to do oftentimes in edited volumes. And I, I love that part of it. It's also Huge. It's totally readable. <laughs> it's, uh, it's been great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, that's right. We have Sharice Clark next week. Um, also, find us virtually. This is another, so. another UTSD person. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes, so we have Sharice Clark. Please be here. Uh, it'll be awesome. Thank you. We'll say hi to Sharice. Oh, I guess I'll see her. Have a good one. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you. That was great. Uh -oh.